Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Asad Lalji. Thank you for joining us this evening. This is Avid Learning's second program at IFB and also our second discussion with Robert Stephens. And there was so much more of Bombay's past that was still left unexplored that we had to have him back for yet another presentation. He might be back for a third. He doesn't know that yet. Uh, but anyway, to our topic at hand. Ever evolving and always under construction, a city so rich in diversity and heritage, a pulsating trade center, a cultural hub, and home to 23 million, Mumbai is truly a multi-dimensional city. Over the past decade, the 45 episodes of AVID's series, Multipolis Mumbai, tried to decode through different lenses this dynamic maximum city. In continuation of our deciphering today, we look at plan versus reality of the making of Bombay and now Mumbai as we know it. Welcome to Sustainability Now, reimagining Bombay with principal architect, RMA architects, and author Robert Stevens. After the successful marquee event around Robert's recently published book, Bombay imagined an illustrated history of uh, the unbuilt city at the Royal Opera House. Today, Robert will share more in-depth perspectives of the city we love. Reimagining Bombay will explore an array of uh, sustainable, radical, yet unrealized plans of Bombay's seemingly eternal challenges, seasonal flooding, water scarcity, the need for more public open spaces and more. Stretching back to the early 1700s, some of the city's deepest thinkers will be introduced on this three-century survey of past futures that never were. This session is part of AVID's ongoing Sustainability Now series, a thematized and targeted series of discussions that aims to convert audiences into change makers and active catalysts and custodians for a greener tomorrow. Before I hand it over to Robert, I request you to take out your phones and put them on silent and start using them. Start posting, reposting. Our handle is at, uh, is at Avid Learning and hashtag is Learning Never Stops. Thank you very much for joining us in such great numbers. Apologize if the seats are short, but this is going to be a great presentation. Thank you. Over to you, Robert. Uh, things before we, we jump into this evening's talk. Of course, thank you all very much for, for coming out. Um, really, really delighted to see each and every one of you here. Uh, two, three things. One, I have a frog in my throat this evening. So if you see me drinking water like a camel, that's, uh, that's the reason. Um, so bear with me. <clears throat> Second thing is, uh, I enjoy humor. Uh, I love making jokes. However, a lot of people, family, friends, sometimes think my jokes are not all that funny. So if you hear something this evening that sounds like maybe it's a joke, but you don't want to laugh, that's okay. Uh, but there will be a few moments, so, so just bear with us. Yeah, I think that we got it good there. So let's, I thought let's jump in. Um, Asad uh, and the team at Avid, thank you very much uh, for this invitation. So Asad called a couple of weeks ago and said, let's do a talk on sustainability. Can you come up with something from, from Bombay Imagined? And I said, sure, it's a great, fabulous idea. But this word sustainability, I like to think of it like luggage, right? We've all used it at some point, um, but often that usage comes with some kind of baggage, right? So, so this word sustainability, it often comes with baggage, right? We, we use it and it often has, has these varied meanings. So I thought as a, as a first step, uh, it would be wise to visit dictionary.com. That's what I did. And I said, you know, let's plug in sustainability and see what comes up. The first definition, the ability to be sustained, supported, upheld, or confirmed. Nice definition. The second definition, the quality of not being harmful to the environment or depleting natural resources and thereby supporting long-term ecological balance. Now, of course, both very nice definitions. But what I am kind of curious about this evening is this idea of the ability to be upheld, right? I like that. It's, it's a kind of general definition of sustainability and I think something uh, that, that we can all relate to uh, and aspire for. So then I asked, does Bombay need to be upheld as a city, Mumbai, right? This, this place we all call home. So I then started doing research. And of course, of course we do and we've all felt it the last few weeks. Uh, we need to be upheld from chronic flooding, <clears throat> from flooding in low-lying areas, from massive traffic jams, from downpours and high tides, right? 
and from the BMC's monsoon remedial measures failed to hold water. I like that phrase, play on words there. Um, so, so this evening we're really going to look at a series of plans of imaginations for the city that seek to uphold Bombay. And the very first, uh, we're going to kind of walk back to 1720, uh, is by an East India Company Captain Johnson uh, from 1720, the Great Channel. Now, before we jump straight into his plan, we're going to look at a bit of the context of the city, the geography of the city. And many of you will know this, this map. Uh, you know, it's, it's what you see in Hatched. Shows the areas below sea level, right? And that's central Bombay going all the way up to Dharavi. Uh, and, you know, much of the water that uh, historically entered the city was from this area known as the Great Breach. There were many plans, many ideas for how to close this, this kind of entry point for water. Uh, this is, of course, today Hornby Vellard uh, from Haji Ali Junction up to Worli. So, the problem with closing that breach with like a retaining wall, which is what we have now, is it creates a bathtub, right? And Bombay is essentially a giant bathtub. We have this perimeter which is higher than the ocean and the very center of the island is this low-lying kind of depression. So the first idea to deal with this problem of the bathtub, the Great Channel, this was the proposal. It was this, this big 30-meter cut from uh, the Great Breach across to Mazgan. This is what it would have looked like. Uh, this, is, this is what we call a speculation. And just for context again, this is Haji Ali. And um, this was a, a speculative artwork made by Aniket Umari and Fawaz Khan. And this was really the plan. It was to allow water, this, the monsoon, uh, the ocean, to pass through Bombay rather than kind of inundating, going over and flooding the bathtub. And I just, I love this idea because just imagine, had this worked, had this been implemented, rather than the retaining wall at the Great Breach, but the Great Channel, we would have had many more, possibly many more Great Channels crisscrossing the island city. And Bombay very well could have evolved in this manner. It would have been perhaps like Venice. Patrick Geddes, a Scottish polymath in 1922, had this to say, we conquer nature by obeying her. Right? And I think the Great Channel would have been a great example of obedience to nature. So how do you obey nature? Right? And it's really important, I think, to listen. So as I was kind of brainstorming for this talk, I thought, you know, who do I know that's listened to Bombay really well? So I went to a dear friend, Sunil Sippi's book, The Opium of Time, and I started listening through his images. And I came across this fabulous image. Right? And what do you hear from this? You hear the ocean does not want to be kept on a sharp edge at the, the edge of Bombay. It wants to come into the city. Right? Bombay wants, actually wants to be like a Venice. So historically, let's see, who else has thought of the island city as a Venice rather than a city bound by retaining walls on all sides? 1900. This is Juhu. Kardanda. Between the two, there's about a 1,200 acre expanse of marshland in the monsoon. Uh, it's completely inundated underwater. And Jamshed Ji Tata in 1900 said, let's make this a series of 500 acre plots, right? Not a single road would exist. It was a residential development, 501 acre plots, not a single road, and just a series of canals. And from these canals, people would access their properties. <clears throat> it was a fabulous idea. His real estate agent said this, an interesting and very clever idea of utilizing to the greatest extent the advantages of nature and the physical features of the land. So again, perfect example. This was a scheme that obeyed nature rather than trying to conquer it. Who else listened? Of course, Mr. Charles Correa. <clears throat> this is Back Bay. This was an aerial photograph I took about five years ago. And just to give us some context, what is circled is Nariman Point, NCPA. And this is uh, the, the retaining wall, part of the abandoned works for the 1920s Back Bay Reclamation. Yeah. 
So in 1973, uh, the government of Maharashtra came up with a plan to complete the Back Bay Reclamation. It would have involved 550 uh, acres of new reclaimed ground. Uh, again, the top right circle is NCPA. The top left is that existing retaining wall. And everything in between was to be filled with earth. And a harsh edge, another retaining wall, was to be made <coughs> at the city's edge. Charles Correa, much like Jamshedji Tata said, that's not the right solution. What needs to happen is we need a Venice. We need Bombay to be like Venice. So what he said was, let's welcome the bay back into the city. Uh, the existing incom incomplete reclamation was just to be sculpted a bit at the edge, and it was to be made basically a pedestrian um, uh, paradise with cultural facilities, an art and design center, um, just you know, all kinds of all kinds of venues. This was one of the imaginations for that waterfront. On the left, you get a glimpse of the ocean with boats. It was really to be a fantastic uh, public space. Moving on from Venice, um, this this little area circled here. Uh, this is the G D Somani outfall. This was quite popular a few years ago. It came in the news <coughs> 2019 because uh, the outfall had crude sewage emanating from it. And you can see in this image, the bottom left, just this black water uh, pouring straight into the bay. Another observation someone made about a similar situation. All around the island of Bombay was one foul cesspool, sewers discharging on the sand. Sewers whose gaping mouths discharge deep black streams across your path, right? Just like the G.D. Sumani outfall, except this quote was from 1855 by James McLean. He was a Bombay-based journalist. This was a very common uh, sight to see in the city. Again, this is about 150 years after that quote. This is just north of uh, Kardanda. This is Malad Creek. So you see these thick black streams of basically raw sewage just flowing uh, into the ocean. One of the earliest sewage plans uh, to, to deal with this problem was by Russell Aitken. He, he called it the greatest sewer. And basically his, his plan was a subterranean sewer 10 feet in diameter. Uh, now that was an unheard of size. Most sewers at the time were 12 inches, 18 inches. This was a 10 foot diameter sewer stretching from Nal Bazar, the very center of, of the dense inner city, to Kolaba, right? And this was styled on the Cloca Maxima. This was an ancient sewer in Rome, estimated to have been built around 600 BC. Um, and, and this was Aitken's version of the Cloca Maxima for Bombay. Now what he said is, this, if this was the, the island's terrain, again, you get a sense of the bathtub, kind of the sunken middle portion of the city. This 10-foot sewer was to flow underneath the city. At Kolaba, there was to be a reservoir, and then it was to be pumped out to the ocean. Now, of course, that last mile had its own problems, um, but this was one of the earliest kind of attempts to take what, what was a rather ad hoc treatment of sewage and just very laissez-faire relationship with sewage and, and really organize it and, and attempt to discard it responsibly. Now. Journeying onward with the sewage, Hector Tulik, a few years later, came up with an underground railway scheme. This is one of my favorite, favorite proposals uh, from, from Bombay Imagined. And basically, this plan was to take uh, an underground railway from Jacob Circle, today Satrasta, right into the fort. So roughly a straight line from there. This is what he said. During the day, passengers were to be ferried southwards into the city center. Well, at night, northbound carriages filled with the day's business, fecal matter, were to traverse the same tracks, right? This is real. This was actually his proposal. So people moved north-south in the morning and uh, early evening, and then in the late evening, all the poop from the day was to go back uh, to the northern edge of the city. Quite radical. I like to think if we had to name this, this railway line, how it would fit in the city's train network. So we, of course, have the Western Line, right? We have the Central. We have the Harbor Line. The Dream Line is under construction now. We have a new Red Line. 
I think this would have been called the brown line, right? <laughs> and the symbol might have been this big streak. Uh, so that, I think, would have been a fun addition to the city. So this was the plan. The poop was to go from Fort to Jacob Circle. And then he, he built on this proposal uh, a few years later. He said, then let's take all that, that fecal content and let's transport it from Jacob Circle to the very edge of the island city. And that big red kind of blob you see, this was land on which the sewage might be utilized. Right? And just to give some context, that's Chambor, Bandra. And basically all the sewage was to just flood the low-lying land and to be used for irrigation. <clears throat> the advantages of that, of course, are many. One, this is what someone, someone else had to say. The price of vegetables is ridiculously high in Bombay. And it is hoped that if sewage irrigation is carried out, prices will be reduced. I love this quote. It's by Arthur Crawford. Um, in 1869 and of course Crawford Market we all know Arthur Crawford this is him and bear with me for a minute what was Arthur Crawford's least favorite vegetable nobody knows good potato yeah because he was never aloof it's a LJ language joke Alu, aloof he was never aloof Okay, Arthur Crawford was so intimately engaged in the city from every, every kind of idea you could think of, he was engaged and he had ideas and, and we'll see some of these um, this evening. Coming back to Tulik scheme. The present project is for utilizing the sewage proper and not for throwing it into the sea, right? So that was the big difference between Tulik's plan and all the others. Aitken took everything to Kolaba, then threw it deep into sea from there. Tulik said, let's use it to irrigate this land around Chaimpur, between Chaimpur and Bandra. Now, why is that relevant? This is an article from 2017. Senior Mumbai among the most polluted in the world. Right? We are notorious for this. 1939, Love Grove, Love Grove sewage scheme. Anyone, when you pass Love Grove there, it stinks, no? It smells so bad. And there's a viewing gallery with lots of text. I've never seen a person reading there. They just collapse for sure. So 1939, um, Envy Modak, he was, he was a city engineer. Um, <clears throat> he visited in the few years before he published this plan, he visited 76 different cities. Okay, 76 cities, and he studied their sewage treatment um, schemes. And he came back and made this plan. This was uh, about a 40-acre development um, uh, just behind Atrium Mall is this red dot, just the other side of the, the Love Grove channel there. And basically what he said is he had one ambition. It was to eradicate the nuisance caused by the discharge of crude sewage into the sea at Worley. Yeah, and he had all these different sludge digestion tanks, future digestion tanks, sedimentation, bioaeration, gas holders. It was this really complex scheme to basically treat sewage such that he could put it into the ocean, the leftover water, and it was uh, perfectly fine, no harm to, to aquatic life. Um, now, of course, this didn't happen. Um, but uh, I think it's a really, really admirable and really important plan for the city. So that was, of course, to, to, to treat sewage <clears throat> and to drain sewage, how to, to you know, deal with it once we have created. Uh, the second kind of set of plans, or the next set of plans we're going to look at regarding dealing with rainwater, right? And 18, 1882, a man by the name of Dr. Henry Cook, uh, he was a Bombay-based uh, uh, practicing doctor, and he was an amateur artist. Um, he came up with a plan for this, this huge rainwater harvesting lake at Mahalakshmi. Now, this was uh, one of about 30 ideas, plans, visions in the book that we had really vivid text for. Okay, really vivid. They wrote so beautifully about their visions, but there was no drawing, uh, no, no visual content. So uh, I worked with uh, the, the speculative art I, I referenced earlier. I worked with four artists. I made sketches like this uh, that I imagined there would be a still reflective lake, 
In the background would be Haji Ali, surrounded by trees. Um, and then this is what Aniket Umaria, one of the artists, came up with. And I just, I love these. I think they're, they're like absolutely works of art. Um, and this is our imagination of Dr. Henry Cook uh, painting this lake he's created, this rainwater reservoir. Um, I kind of think he, he maybe was a little selfish. He made this plan so that he could go there and paint when it happened. Because uh, it would have been really idyllic, I think. Patrick Geddes in 1915 had this to say. Same area. Whether it might not be possible to leave a certain amount of open water or clean park lake. Right? He was referring to that same area in Mahalakshmi. So you see this constant repetition of ideas uh, of how to deal with the bathtub that is Bombay, the central low-lying part of the city. 1865, I'm going to come back to Arthur Crawford for a minute. Um, and he has this vision for a 400-acre park, right? For those of you who have either heard another talk or seen an online talk, uh, this was the plan that really started this whole um, exploration of Bombay's unbuilt past, right? Arthur Crawford's 400-acre park. Now, for me, one of the really fascinating things about this, this proposal is not the park itself, actually. What he proposed is at the entrance of the park, there was to be a statue. And I think this would have been Bombay's first and only sustainability statue. A statue, the statue was to be a fool in a cap. Okay, so just imagine that, a fool in a cap. Pick the most foolish person you know and put a cap on him. Okay, and below it, in four languages, I presume English, Hindi, Gujarati, Urdu, it's my guess, was this quote. Forgive us for we know not what we did. Okay, and Arthur Crawford's plan was that this statue was to reference previous politicians, previous commissioners before him, who took all the city's waste and dumped it at this area in Mahalakshmi. They created an unregulated landfill in the precinct of the city, basically. And this was his way of condemning them, basically, saying you're guilty and you now need to confess your guilt. Forgive us, for we know not what we did. Now just imagine, if that had happened, and today whenever you pass Haji Ali Juice Center, you see this fool in a cap there, okay? It really makes me wonder, would we have then done this? Okay, this is the Maloon dumping ground. If uh, Maybe no one's visited it here. I've not been. Um, this is an image from about five years ago. It looks like an atomic bomb, no? It's, it's the dumping ground at Maloon. Or Deonar. Right? Deonar is a similar scheme. In 1981, MCGM, plan much like Arthur Crawford. Arthur Crawford proposed to, on top of that dumping ground, create a public park. MCGM in 1981 proposed a city park above Deonar. Right? Crawford, I also like his mustache. This is, I, I constantly can keep looking at this image and just feel inspired. Talk a little bit about water now. So we've looked at sewage, rainwater, a lot of drainage, flooding. Now let's talk about drinking water, and I'm doing okay. Again, continuing with Crawford, um, he was a really interesting man. One of the, the, the proposals he made, this was in 1870, he said the Mumba Devi Temple Tank, which is now the, the open ground behind Mumba Devi Temple, it's I think a parking lot, it has a small school, um, he proposed that tank should be developed as basically a public space with black and white marble steps leading down to the waterfront with seats, with gardens. It was to be this really vibrant hub, basically. And there was an opium bazaar on one side. He said that should be raised so from the street, the general public can see the tank. It was a really, I think, ambitious and and really sensitive proposal because he understood the importance of water um, in, in the cultural, social, spiritual lives of Bombay's residents. Now, speaking of water, thinking about these tanks and wells, this is a map from the 1850s. Every black dot you see in this map is an open tank or an open well, right? There are hundreds, hundreds of such um, uh, pieces of infrastructure in the city at this time. 
And in 1852, Henry Conybeare comes up with this really, I think, quite radical plan. He says, because Bombay is struggling for potable water, for drinking water, let's insert a series of filtering wells into every tank in Bombay. And basically, these filtering wells were to just separate all the pollution, uh, kind of the impurities from the water, into this really clean cistern in each tank. And it means the city would have had a kind of disaggregated water supply system. Every locality would have had access to fresh potable water nearby. Uh, it's a beautiful drawing, what he made, you, all the details, quite uh, elegant. Of course, that didn't happen. And Bombay went the route of creating mega reservoirs you know, dozens, sometimes hundreds of kilometers away. This was one scheme that followed Connie Bear's failed uh, pavilions. This is the Shilwa Reservoir. It's near Tansa, present-day Tansa. And this was a journey of about 90 kilometers, right? This is the, the direction we went. So rather than the disaggregated proposal uh, of Connie Bear's, we went with this kind of singular systems far, far away. And again, for scale, that's the island city. And this is why that's important, right? Water loss in Mumbai at 50% is highest in the country. And this is from 2011. So half of the water that we collect at Shelwa, Tansa, all these reservoirs, by the time it reaches the city, half of it is lost, right? That's extremely, extremely um, unsustainable. And that's why, why we still struggle with water supply in the city today. Now, the Bombay, it's, you know, this is the highest in the country. And that's because in all things, it seems we are the maximum city, right? So that kind of spurs it more questions. How do we sustain? Is it by using minimal resources, by recycling, and by both? So I'd like to introduce some who I think are Bombay's best recyclers, right? And minimalists, because I think both kind of go hand in hand. And the first is William Walker. Uh, I, I really love this man. Uh, Bombay Imagined is dedicated to him. His beard is also, I think, quite uh, contemporary now. Um, and this was, this was William Walker. He was in Bombay from 1845 to 1865. Um, he, he loved the city. And <clears throat> uh, one of the many, many plans and imaginations he had for the city was, uh, was this, cremation. Uh, he came up with a scheme that he called luminous cremation. And it's a long text, bear with me, I'm going to read it all. Uh, and these are William Walker's words, yeah? Fastidious people may be shocked and startled at the scheme, but on what reasonable grounds? Is a man of mark whose whole life has been devoted to the enlightenment of his fellow countrymen to be quenched from our sight forever by the fell stroke of death or, and leave but a scintillating ray behind? Forbid it, economy and common sense. Does it cost nothing, thank you, to clothe the ribs with rich store of carbon that it should, should be afterwards wasted in the desert air, the very marrow of our complaint? Would it not create a sweet, sweetly mournful feeling in our breast to see that, although our friend be dead, yet meteor-like as in life, he was shedding an effulgent ray to dispel the darkness before seeking the flowing galaxy of light in the other world? I'm not sure if that made sense, right? Basically, what he wanted to do when the body of deceased was cremated, he wanted to collect all the gas and then transport that to lamps throughout the city and then light all the street lamps with the gas created from these cremations. So bear with me once more. Why did he want to light the streets? I give 100 rupees for anyone who gets the answer. No, because he was a walker. <laughs> ah, thank you. <laughs> Touched. Thank you. <laughs> so in 1863, Walker is recycling the dead, right? He was one of Bombay's best recyclers. Two years later, this other really interesting scheme, public transportation for the deceased. I think Bombay would have been the only city in the world with a public transport system for people who couldn't even buy tickets. 1865, this is the burial commission's plan for a 252-acre cemetery at Matunga. It was this really, really radical plan. They said, let's close every small cemetery, um, cremation ground in the city, close them all, consolidate everything at Matunga. Okay? And then to make access simple, they built a dedicated railway line. Right? 
This is Fawaz. Fawaz is here. This is one of his works. It's a really beautiful work of art. Uh, please, if you, if you buy the book, buy it just for this because it's, it's gorgeous. So let's revisit the lines, right? We have to name our, our line. So we have the Western line, Central, Harbor, Dream, Red, the brown line we already met earlier, right, with Hector Tuluk, the streak symbol. And then we have the deadline, right? And this would have been the ultimate deadline, I think, this line. That's a joke. Okay. William Walker, another portrait of him, still has the really lush beard. So he was in Bombay when Arthur Crawford was commissioner. I think they must have met and they must have compared their, their facial hair plans, both very intense. <clears throat> and this was a really crazy scheme that William Walker came up with. It's one of his first plans for the city, 1861. And I'm going to focus us in the center of the city here. Okay? So remember that, that low-lying bathtub? Here the map says, Bella sees drain inundated in the monsoon. Right? So this is that central depression. Hornby's Velard was built by this time, the retaining wall, but retaining walls don't work in Bombay. The sea just comes over because nobody listens, right? Um, thanks, Sunil. Um, so Walker says the central area is meant to be flooded. It's meant to have water. So he was listening, and this is what he came up with. He said, let's put a dock in the very center of the city where water is meant to be. Let's really welcome the water in. And for context, this is it. Now, this would have changed the entire trajectory of the city if this had happened, and he wanted it to. The first thing it would have meant is the entire Back Bay reclamation would never have happened. Okay, so all that activity and construction in the south and moving mountains, cutting mountains in the north and shipping all the rocks to the south would have never happened because there would have been no need for it, right? Minimizing reclamation. Right? He was a minimalist, a recycler and a minimalist. Then the entire center of gravity would have shifted up. Right? So instead of south, everything in the south it would have gone to the central node. Now, the office where I work is in Kalagoda, so I suffer that commute like so many of you here do. Um, you know, The gravity center would have shifted up for the benefit of many. Basically, what if Ma Lakshmi had become Bombay's central business district? That's the question he was asking. If that had happened, Nariman Point would have never existed. And if Nariman Point never existed, the coastal road and these dozens of schemes to connect, you know, Kandivli with Nariman Point would not have happened. Now, of course, nobody really listened to William Walker. Um, and the Back Bay Reclamation did proceed, which you see in green here is the scheme from 1863. Uh, Nariman Point did happen. And because the center of business really was concentrated in the south, what that meant was the center of the island became the industrial hub, right? Very center. And all the mills, basically, uh, from Tardeo up through Parel, all the mills were consolidated in this relatively uh, empty but quite low-lying lands. Now, for more than a century, of course, the mills were thriving. Uh, you know, uh, they employed thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of, of people. Um, but then, of course, in the 80s and 90s, the mills started shutting. So. This created a, an opportunity. Um, there were more than 58 mills that were defunct, no longer functioning by 1996. And this is basically a great opportunity for recycling, right? You have these plots in the middle of the city just waiting to be uh, developed. <clears throat> and Charles Correa set up, again, Mr. Correa, who we met from the Back Bay Venice scheme, he set up a committee that looked at all these mill properties. And basically what, uh, what their committee said was each property should be divided into three different uses, a one-third scheme, a public open space, uh, social housing, and then a third for development, right? commercial development. Um, it, was, it was quite a, a radical scheme. And then within all of this, they also evolved an open space network where all these properties would be connected with green spaces, with aven avenues, promenades, um, to, to really bring kind of a sense of cohesion to central Bombay. 
These were some of their visualizations. This was a housing scheme. Uh, they also proposed to keep certain mill buildings, much like IFB where we are now, and then convert them into new kind of adaptive reuse spaces. <coughs> and this was their vision. Instead of a meaningless hodgepodge of development, large and viable parcels of land can be made available in a pattern which makes overall urban sense for the city. Now, of course, this didn't happen. Um, the, the kind of builder community did not take too well to this, this one-third proposal, and eventually the Supreme Court upheld that the one-third rule applies only to vacant space on these properties of which there was essentially a minuscule amount, so nothing ever happened to this plan, unfortunately. And this is central Bombay today. Uh, it is in many ways a meaningless hodgepodge of development. Now, about three decades prior to this, this grand recycling scheme, we have a, a plan that probably many of us know of, New Bombay, right? Charles Correa, Pravina Mehta, and Mr. Sharish Patel. Uh, and basically what they said was, Bombay, especially South Bombay, is just, it's overcrowded. It's completely maxed out. We need to disaggregate. We need to split Bombay into two separate cities, two um, independent functioning cities rather than one inner city and suburbs surrounding. So they proposed to, to create a new central government hub uh, on the mainland. This was one of the structural plans. Um, but I like to think of this as basically splitting Bombay into two, right? So that things get dispersed and everything becomes a bit more livable. This is what Mr. Correa said in 1971. What we really need is a kind of open-ended planning, one which changes the structure of Bombay so as to maximize the growth options available to the next generation. I like that. Two decades before this, Claude Batley, a practicing architect in Bombay, he taught at JJ, he had this plan. Bombay should spread itself out into a group of 25 coastal townships, right? That's crazy, you know? Like we, we hear so much about the Korea, uh, Pravina Mehta and Sharish Patel plan of a new Bombay, two cities, two twin cities, and Claude Batley saying, let's make it 25 cities, right? Rad, it's really radical. If this is the Bombay region, that's the island city, Ndhanu is here in the north, Alibag in the south. And basically, Claude Batley's plan was this, that we're going to have these 25 townships. They'll be connected by air, by sea, by land. Batley said this, community life for bachelors and childless couples would be vastly more economical than the present individualistic mode of life. I like that. Bombay is a very expensive city, so... Anything that's more economical is welcome. This is, of course, the island city today. It's an image from a couple of years ago. Um, you can see the, the West Island Freeway, the coastal road reclamation there. Um, and Bombay never split into two. It, of course, never split into 25. It's one city. It's this long north-south city. It's super dense. It has many problems that we all know perfectly well, um, but I'm an optimist. And uh, my wife sometimes gets annoyed that all the bad things in life, I just forget them. Like, I erase them from my mind after two or three months. So I'm constantly just thinking ahead uh, of, of what good I can. So <clears throat> it is what it is. We have what we have. And how do we now make this? Uh, a more sustainable, a more livable city? How do we uphold Bombay going forward? And there, I think there are two essential options. One is we create new land, right? And we create new facilities on that land. The coastal road is a perfect example. I personally don't think that's the way of the future, but that's one option. The second option is to then take, instead, take little bits and pieces within the city and really sculpt something new out of them. Recycle those bits and pieces afresh. And that could be dispersed all over in different neighborhoods, different localities. I'm going to talk about a few of those options, these, these kind of microscopic sculptings uh, of the city. 
This is one of them uh, by Abraham John Architects, a Bandra-based firm. And what they said is, let's take the Mahalakshmi Bridge, which is uh, structurally, technically unsound at the moment, um, and let's make it into a, a pedestrian overbridge. Now the BMC is planning additional flyovers on either side of this bridge, so this will become redundant. My sense in five years it will be demolished. But what they said is keep the bridge, make it just for pedestrian use, and then the hundreds of thousands of people that exit Mahalakshmi Station can use this bridge conveniently, and it's a pleasant public space to get to and from where they're going. I think it's a really nice uh, idea. This is one of the visualizations for that plan. This is when that bridge reaches Satrasta. A very beautiful, I think, geometry, what they envision. This is a second uh, kind of sculpting plan, recycling plan. And this is, of course, Ballard Estate, where we are. There are about four urban courtyards in Ballard Estate uh, that were designed by George Whitted, the master planner. And by and large, they're decrepit. Most of them are gated and locked. Um, and Studio PKA, again, uh, an office based here in Fort, um, they said, let's you know, kind of bring new life to these courtyards, make them vibrant public spaces. Let's have cafes, amphitheaters, art spaces. Uh, and I think this is a really nice proposal. Um, and much like the Sat Rasta proposal by Abraham John Architects, essentially a very low cost scheme. There's no land acquisition. Um, it just means a little bit of creative thinking and using what we have well. Another plan by AJA. If you see the Juhu Aerodrome, it's super large, uh, but it's of course off limits to the public. And simply put, their, their proposal is let's make it a 385 acre public park. Again, the land is there, it just needs to be opened. And, you know, there are many more schemes, um, uh, you know, like these that I think are actually quite doable. Um, very low cost. Uh, again, just the core of them is creative thinking, being sensitive, and, and having this mindset of how can we uphold Bombay, how can we make a city that's, that's more sustainable in the future? Uh, I'm going to plug now. Please, um, please do consider purchasing a book there at the back. These are, this is the new Bombay spread. Um, you know, it has, it has 200 plans. There are many more uh, that are, if a topic of sustainability, um, you know, is of interest to you, there are many more plans in the book. Uh, that I've not touched on. And just before we close, I'd like to introduce some of the team behind the book. Uh, this is Aniket Umaria. He's one of the speculation artists, one of four. Uh, Deshna Mehta and Carol Nair, they designed the book. Uh, they're super talented, sensitive designers. Fawaz Khan, he was the project manager. Uh, he was a speculation artist, overlay artist, many things. Fawaz is here, if you see him, say hi. Um, <coughs> Vrimshi and Shittij uh, created relief maps, so every project has a map of the city at that time. Uh, Praveen and Shah Alam Sheikh were part of the production team, and they really, you know, with, with their team, which you see not even everyone's here, but a majority, they really created what I think is a work of art. Uh, each book is, is really beautifully crafted. Uh, so please do consider picking one up. This is our home. Bonnie, our cat, uh, is always, he's always on top of things. Uh, we're really grateful to her. Tina, my wife, uh, has not only supported, uh, we decided to self-publish the book together. So that's another good reason to buy. So we can, uh, you know, get back some of our investment. Um, and Tina manages all of the social media, the website, everything. She's really done a fantastic job. And then Kai... Uh, who some of you have seen running around in the front. Uh, he's, uh, he's been helpful all along. So thank you very much uh, for, for being such a wonderful audience and laughing at some jokes. Thank you. Guys, uh, as you can see, there's a little, little mic issue. So just put your hands up, stand up, and shout out your question. Do you understand? Of countless white men, privileged men, and I don't see any women. The few women that I've seen are towards the end of the presentation. Yeah. And
and this is a systemic problem that has left behind most of the city. The whole city is designed to benefit the upper class. So I, I, I find it quite shocking that you would say that these ideas are forward thinking from the 1700s. But it was really quite technocratic and it was quite regressive and it was just in place to reinforce certain class structures, class structures in society. Thanks. Thank you for your question. I'll just repeat it. I'll try to paraphrase it. So, one, she didn't see any women in the presentation, uh, by and large, which is right, and we'll touch on that in a minute. Uh, and two, if all the the ideas, not all, majority of the ideas were, you, you said, by privileged white men, um, how are they progressive? Right? Is that more or less the... Thank you for that question. Um, so I'll start with the, the question of gender because it's, it's a really good one. It came up uh, as the book was, was being finished because I also was reflecting on this. Brinda Somaya has a plan in the book for an esplanade, a pedestrian esplanade that connects all the green spaces that kind of wrap around South Bombay from CST to Gateway. Uh, that wasn't in the talk, but it's in the book, um, so I'm delighted for that. And the only other uh, uh, woman architect is Zaha Hadid. Um, and that wasn't a sustainable thing per se, it was just a nice piece of architecture. So, <clears throat> that's unfortunate, right? Um, and I, I can't solve that. Uh, that's the reality, that the majority of um, practicing planners, people whose work has been published on Bombay were men, right? That's the reality of it. Um, and I can't fix that, unfortunately. Now, I would, my, my own sense is I would not tie that problem to the quality of ideas, right? Because I think just because an idea comes from a privileged white male does not make the idea bad. Okay, it can happen, but that doesn't mean it will happen. So I, I would advise, I think it's important to see the ideas for what they are, rather than seeing them as ideas by a man or a woman. Uh, I, I, don't, I, I don't think it's fair to judge either on either of those criteria. I think those are other problems that have to be solved by our generation through other means. So that's my, my take on it. I hope that answers your question. Um, so among all the plans and several of that you might have, uh, what is the ideal way to create a transit system? Is it like an LRT system or a DRT system? How do you have a public transport plan to go out the DMRT system? Mm, yeah. So the question is, how do you create an ideal transport system, yeah. right? And I think <clears throat> in 1945, there was this plan called the Master Street Plan, okay? And they made a theoretical framework on what an ideal road network in Bombay would look like. It was a series of cross streets horizontally and vertically, right? But for me, the plan was actually less interesting. What was more interesting at the end of their report, it was about a 40-page report, they said we need to establish a committee that brings all of the transportation networks under one head, right? Um, rather than separate, separate, bus is one, train is one, road network is one. Um, they said everything needs to fall under one head. Only then there will be some coherence to transportation in Bombay. And to date that has not happened uh, in my understanding. So I think that's the way, that's the, the way to to take what we have and try to make it more efficient and cohesive. Um, the question, Patrick Geddes, 
uh, yeah, so, so basically it's a comment and a question. The, f the comment was Patrick Geddes was critical of British officials who by and large um, did not take culture into consideration in plans, right? They were like scientists. They were just not scientists, sorry for anyone who's a scientist. They were very objective, I'd say, um, and they didn't see the, the, the subjective parts of life. Um, so, whereas Patrick Geddes was like culture centric, right? That was everything emanated from people, then plans evolved around people. Um, so, I think one of the exciting discoveries for me in, in all this research was that wasn't always true about uh, British officials. You look at Arthur Crawford, um, so many of his plans were people centric. The Mumba Devi Temple Tank, um, the, eight, the 400 acre park at Mar Lakshmi. I think the problem Getty saw, and he was right, is the bureaucracy that, that the, 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 um, the, the kind of British officials had made was as a culture very, um, it was just, ugh, it, it was not good. Um, so like when Arthur Crawford spoke up, like he was, he was a one-off, you know, he wasn't setting the tone for everything that was happening. Um, and, uh, and perhaps maybe that's also one of the reasons why so many people hated him. Uh, you know, the, the, he was just, he was not liked by, by uh, many. So um, yeah, it, it's not black and white. It's not black and white. Hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Sir. I'm fascinated by the idea of how Jacob Sutton came up with it. So, city getting corrected to a point. There are a lot of other circles, like King Circle or maybe a science circle or something. Can we plan out something similar so that we can correct it? The, the east-west connectivity is a, a big question. Um, I don't have an answer, but uh, all I can say is I think that that Mill Land's proposal by the Korea Committee in 96 really tried to, at least for the pedestrian, connect many of these junctions, right? Um, and uh, I've since, since that point, I've not seen a plan that tries to, to do that so cohesively. Now there are a, a number of east-west connections coming up, but I think by and large they're either for cars or uh, like monorail um, or metro. Uh, n n I've not seen anything for the pedestrian. Um, apart from, I, I didn't touch on it here, but PK Das and AJA proposed a lot of, they both proposed schemes over the railway tracks so that pedestrians can cross the railway tracks without having to cross the the tracks literally, um, so that's that's one one idea that comes to mind immediately. Yeah. Then we'll continue. Uh, oh. 19th, 18th century, so trying to stop them all together. Is, I haven't done a very good job. That's right. In a hundred years' time, how big is mobilised planning for a one and a half to two metre sea level rise? I. I don't know of any such plan, <laughs> quite honestly. Um, I, I, know, I know we know this will happen, um, but I've, I've not seen or heard of, has anyone, does any, if anyone knows, feel free to, no, okay. <laughs> yeah, there's no solution for that right now. Yeah, apart from around 2050, I think, this is projected that will be two meters underwater. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, so my, my question is this, regarding the political will. You know, there is one, one way that you have architects and people planning for it, then the, and it should be backed by a political will for it, right? Because they are the ultimate authority to right? So you reflect on them. And also, when you talk about certain plans, uh, you know, it requires a certain acquisition and a uh, lot of things. And we may be at disposition of the people living there. And suppose if a political person says that no, this is the area I'm getting votes from, so how do they deal with it? And if you can reflect upon any of the plans which have not been implemented because of the, which was not being backed by the politicians, the legislature. I don't think I can answer that question well. <laughs> um, you know, this is, 
in architecture school, at least where I studied, this is, I think, one of the shortfalls, is that we learn a lot about design. And we don't learn about all the other layers and complexities of life that start actually when design is finished, per se. Um, and Bombay is especially complex in that regard. Um, so I don't have an answer except to say you're exactly right. Nothing will happen without the blessings of the political powers that be. And the process of obtaining those blessings, I do not know much about, <laughs> um, to be honest. So that's all I can say to that. We can probably ask you some questions later by your yep. books. Yep. Sign. Yeah. So Dick, one, one last. Thank you all. Yeah. So you did focus on um, you know, how the city is sort of, the business center is focused in the south part of the city, right? Um, and, um, you know, the Bombay is a very linear city. We have three major roads that sort of connect the north to the south. And most people travel from the north to the south. And, um, you know, the local train has been the only sort of viable option for the most part of the compact to travel through the city. Um, so I just wanted to know your opinions on the coastal road and, you know, the metro that's being built. Okay. Uh, <laughs> my opinions on the coastal road. Um, so I actually did a, a one and a half hour talk on the coastal road a couple of years ago. So what I'll do is I'll just re-upload that and send it to you because I don't think everyone wants to stay for another hour. Um, I have many thoughts on that, but uh, sorry. Short. Uh, out, uh, no, no, outdated. The coastal road is a product of the 1950s, 1960s when the motor vehicle was the future of public transport, or transport in the city. That's no longer the case. It can't be the case with cities as dense as ours. So in short, it's outdated. Um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, we, we have uh, a number of books, and we would be delighted if you would support. Uh, so please do stop by the bookstore just in the back. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, thank you guys for coming. I know it was a little tedious with the sound and the heat. Uh, but uh, thank you to IFBI for hosting us. Um, uh, this is the second session here. We have many interesting programs coming up. In fact, if anyone's interesting, we have a very interesting workshop tomorrow on appreciating sound. And next week, next Friday, at the Royal Opera House, we're doing uh, a very interesting talk on photography with Rohit Chavla. So information is by the desk. Or just check out our website or stalk us on social media. Thank you guys once for coming and have a wonderful evening. Good night.